Hello, my name is Russell Warren. I head up the tax team at Travel Smith. I'd like to welcome you to the 13th episode in our Travelling Seamlessly Global Mobility podcast series, which will be part one of a two part episode on US tax. In this series, members of the Travel Smith Global Mobility team will talk to you about the implications of moving your people and operations into and out of different countries, and also look at situations where members of your team may need to work in more than one country. In this episode, Sylvain de Vandeval and Siv Devakumar will be sitting down with our friends at Choate, Paul and Stuart, to discuss the key features that distinguish UK and US approaches to the structuring of management incentive plans in a private equity context. When dealing with international management teams, creating incentive plans that are tax efficient across multiple jurisdictions is a priority. However, the tax treatment of UK design structures in different jurisdictions can raise some issues. The US in particular is known for its wide tax net, which means that US tax issues often need to be considered even when they have not necessarily been anticipated. Chota here to help us shed some light on some of these considerations and will be sharing with us the US approach to several common aspects of a typical share incentive arrangement. To find out more about the issues discussed in this podcast, the Travis Smith Global Mobility Team and how we can help with your global mobility projects, you can visit our website www.travismith.com and search for Global Mobility. And now over to Sid and Silvana to introduce our guest. Hi everyone and welcome to the latest podcast in the Global Mobility series. I'm Silvana van der Veld. And I'm Sid Dovacoma. We are both senior associates in our tax team here at Travis Smith. Today, we are very pleased to be joined by Dave Molo Christensen from Chote, Hall & Stewart for a discussion on some of the US tax points to look out for in relation to management equity incentives, particularly in the context of a typical private equity transaction. Thank you for joining us, Dave. First of all, please can you tell us a bit about Chote and your tax practice? Thanks very much, Silvana, for inviting me to join you today. I'm Dave Molo Christensen and I lead the Exec Comp and Employee Benefits Practice here at Chote. A little about Chote, you know, Chote is a premier law firm that provides national and international representation to industry leading clients. We practice at the top of the market in a select group of areas, including middle market, private equity and M&A. Some of the country's best known and most active private equity sponsors and their portfolio companies trust Chote to guide them through all stages of a transaction and to provide the strategic advice needed to meet their business objectives. As for me, I have a very broad practice advising on compensation benefits issues, both in a transactional and more of an ongoing advisory context. But the primary focus of my practice relates to compensation and benefits issues that arise in M&A transactions, particularly private equity. Thanks for that intro, Dave. Since we found we had so much to say on this topic, the episode is going to be split in two parts. Part one, which we'll discuss today, We'll cover the differences between the UK and US tax net and then discuss the key considerations in each jurisdiction on setting up a management incentive plan or MIP. Part two will then focus on the tax points to think about when exiting that MIP. Great. Well, to kick things off, the first point worth considering is when will US tax be relevant? In a UK context, an individual is broadly only liable to income tax in the UK if they're resident in the UK or otherwise carrying out work here. Dave, I understand the US casts its tax net much wider than that. Yes, that's, that's right, Silvana. Unlike some other jurisdictions, the US takes the view that any US citizen or permanent resident, which people colloquially usually are known as green card holders, is subject to tax on their worldwide income. Exactly how that income is taxed is a complex mix of factual circumstances and things like U.S. tax treaties with other countries. That global reach concept, though, means that particularly for equity and other deferred compensation schemes, certain U.S. tax rules have to be taken into consideration, even if we think the income that's actually earned by a U.S. citizen or permanent resident will, practically speaking, be taxed abroad. So it's easy to see how unexpected U.S. tax charges could arise where there's no obvious U.S. connection. And it will therefore always be important, particularly in the current world of global mobility, to check if there are U.S. citizens involved in a transaction. Dave, we understand that U.S. citizens will always be subject to U.S. tax, but are there any ways for U.S. residents to leave the U.S. tax net? Yes, so for U.S. citizens and permanent residents, that global reach is going to continue as long as they maintain that status. 
for individuals who are treated as a U.S. resident based on their presence in the U.S. in a given year, this is generally referred to as the substantial presence test when we're determining this, even if they were to leave the U.S. partway through a future year, they can still be treated as a U.S. resident if that year of certain tests are met. If they're trying to leave their U.S. resident status in order to, to break that residence connection, an individual would need to be in the U.S. fewer than 31 days in a year. Or if they happen to cross that 31-day threshold, it, it needs to be the case that they're in the U.S. for fewer than 183 days in the prior three years. And I won't get into the details on that, but the way that you count those 183 days is weighted depending on the year we're looking at, i.e., you know, whether the current year or the prior two years. It's also important to note, though, that just because an individual breaks their U.S. resident status in the current year, that doesn't necessarily change or exclude from U.S. tax income that they earned or deferred during the period when they were treated as a U.S. resident. Thanks, Dave. I think that sets the scene nicely around when U.S. tax is going to be relevant and considering a MIT. Now, moving on to talk about what we need to think about when we're setting up a MIT in the U.K. and the U.S. In both jurisdictions, the aim will be to set up an incentive plan with an affordable acquisition cost without triggering any tax charges and with the intention of achieving capital gains tax, certainly in the UK. In the UK and most other jurisdictions, a capital return is usually taxed at a lower rate than income. In the UK, the difference is between a 20% rate on capital versus a 45% rate on income returns. Is there a similar distinction in the US? Yes, Silvana, there, there is a similar distinct difference in the US. You know, for federal income tax purposes, the highest regular you know, wage income tax rate is 37.5% currently, and the long-term capital gain tax rate, which means you hold property for more than a year, is approximately 24%. And that's a combination of the pure long-term rate, which is also 20% like the UK, um, but there's also an additional tax that kicks in above certain thresholds that was added in connection with the, the adoption of the Affordable Care Act about 15 years ago. Um, it's also important to note there, there are state tax considerations, um, both just in terms of the ordinary income tax in a given state and potentially additional capital gain rates that could apply. And that is, again, just a state-by-state -state test that you have to take a look at. So in the UK, in order to achieve that capital treatment, one important factor is that the managers pay at least what we call unrestricted market value for any shares they acquire under the MIT. Unrestricted market value here means the amount which would be paid for the shares between a willing buyer and a willing seller, ignoring any restrictions like lever provisions, which apply to the shares. Is the position similar in the US, Dave? Yes, it is similar in the US. Um, if an employee is purchasing equity and doesn't want to incur additional compensation income, they do need to make sure the purchase is at fair market value. That said, you know, particularly in the private equity context, as a practical matter, fair market value is just going to be the per share price or per unit price paid in connection with the M&A transaction by the private equity buyer. And that's going to be viewed as an arm's length value price. When we're determining that, we also don't take into account things like lever provisions or other restrictions. On this point, though, I, I note that, as we'll, we'll discuss some more later, U.S. profits interests and stock options, which are the most common equity instruments in U.S. MIPS for private equity sponsors, uh, there's no price that's paid for either of these when they're actually granted. Profits interests are generally never paid for, um, and for options, the price that's paid for the shares is at the time that they're actually exercised. And just on this point about capital versus ordinary income, it's important to note that for options as a general matter, uh, the exercise price needs to be fair market value as of the date they're granted. But when employees actually exercise their options, those options are going to be taxed at ordinary income rates based on the difference between the exercise price they pay and the fair market value of the shares at the time that they exercise them. So although there's a similar market value principle there, our experience is that the valuation methodologies, which are expected by the relevant tax authorities, are different between the US and the UK, and that can lead to different results. So in the UK, generally the tax authorities want evaluation for shares in a management incentive plan to be carried out on a look forward basis. Speaking very generally, this broadly covers any method which factors in the future hope value of the shares. However, my understanding is that the methodology employed in the US is usually different and so may result in a higher valuation than in the UK for the same shares. Is that right, Dave? Yes, that's right, Siv. You know, again, without going in too much into specifics, 
my experience is that the UK taxing authorities allow for additional factors to be considered that discount the value from a pure arm's length transaction type value that would result in a lower valuation overall, uh, particularly for stock or partnership or LLC interests, you know, as compared to what the US taxing authorities will respect. Um, the one important caveat there is that US profits interests, you know, which again are very common in, with private equity sponsors, as long as you comply with the relevant IRS notice guidance in order to have a valid profits interest, those are treated as having no taxable value at the time that they're granted. Well, that, that's interesting, that difference in valuation methodologies. So setting aside profits interest for a second, which we're going to come on to talk about in a minute, where we don't have a profits interest, that, that difference in valuation methodologies can lead to some tension in setting up an international net. Clearly, all the participants want to prevent a tax charge arising in acquisition, but at the same time, they all want to pay the same amount for the shares they're requiring to create economic alignment amongst the management team. So if you do end up in a situation where you have different UK and US valuations for the same MIP, it's something that's going to need to be factored into your commercial position. If values become too high, it may be worth looking at alternative ways to structure the MIP, which can achieve the same results. Now, Dave, you mentioned earlier about profits interest schemes potentially being a way to deal with this point as you don't have to pay market value on grant. Could you tell us a bit more about how that scheme works? Yes, I'm happy to, so, so I often refer to U.S. profits interests as, you know, the flavor of equity award that's been kind of sprinkled with magic fairy tax dust because it captures this sort of perfect balance where there's no tax at grant, and as long as you comply with the relevant requirements, the holder gets to receive capital gain treatment on amounts they actually receive in the future in respect to the profits interest. Um, so just taking a step back, you know, at a high level, a profits interest is, you know, an ownership interest in a partnership or a limited liability company that's taxed for, for U.S. purposes as a partnership. And that profits interest will entitle the holder to share in future appreciation in the value of the business. Uh, in order for an award to be a, a valid or good profits interest under the IRS guidance, uh, there are a few key requirements that I'll, that I'll highlight. First, the profits interest needs to be granted to someone in connection with their provision of services to the partnership or the, the LLC. Uh, second, it has to be the case factually that if the partnership or LLC were dissolved on the date that the profits interest was granted, the holder would not be entitled to any distributions in connection with that dissolution. Uh, said another way, or if you want an analogy, similar to the way a typical stock option works, you know, the profits interest can't be in the money at the time of, that, that it's granted. Uh, and last, um, you know, once the recipient receives the profits interest, they can't dispose of that profits interest within two years from the date of grant. Uh, just to note for, for folks on the phone, that, you know, there are a few other requirements. You know, for example, the partnership can't be a publicly traded partnership for U.S. tax purposes, but that and a few other of those requirements just generally aren't relevant to the private equity context, so I'm not going to go into them. Thanks. That sounds like a really useful and tax efficient arrangement for U.S. managers. While we don't have anything similar in the UK, we have seen an international MIP structured in such a way to enable it to qualify as a profits interest in the US and also work effectively for UK managers. Siv, could you tell us a bit about that? Of course. The way we've seen this done is to set up the MIP in a company which has been checked open for US tax purposes, meaning it's regarded as a partnership in the US. Two different classes of MIP shares are then issued, which enables the US managers to receive their shares as profits interests for nil consideration, while UK managers get their shares in exchange for full unrestricted market value consideration. The shares would have identical rights and the only difference would be the upfront subscription cost. Thanks, Siv. Now, moving on to another factor which is relevant to achieving capital gains treatment in the UK. As mentioned previously, in the UK generally, you would expect the gain realised on the sale of shares to be taxed as capital. But where those shares are held by reason of employment and are subject to restrictions, for example, lever provisions, there is a risk that a portion of the proceeds received on sale will instead be subject to employment tax under the rules known as the Restrictive Securities Regime. So is there any way to prevent this employment tax arising? Thankfully, yes, there's a simple way to deal with this. Within 14 days of acquisition of the shares, the employee and the employer must enter into an election known as a Section 431 election, which will effectively remove the shares from the restricted securities regime and prevent employment tax arising under that regime on a future sale of the shares. Dave, we understand there's a similar issue and a similar election process to address it in the US. 
Can you tell us a bit about that? Yes, so that, that's right. So in the US, in connection to the receipt of certain types of equity awards, um, an employee has the choice whether to file something called an 83B election. Uh, using restricted stock is sort of the primary example where this comes up. Uh, you know, restricted stock is something that's subject to future vesting, and it generally will not be taxable to the employee until the stock actually vests. Uh, when that stock vests, the employee is going to be subject to ordinary income, not capital gain, on the fair market value of the stock at the time of vesting. Uh, however, if the employee chooses to do so, they can make an 83B election, um, and that election needs to be made within 30 days, unlike 14 for a 431 election, uh, and that's 30 days within from the date of the grant of the stock. Uh, and if they do that, the value of the stock at grant will be included as ordinary income at that time, and then in the future, the employee will receive capital gain tax treatment on the value of the stock when it's sold. By doing that, the employee can basically choose whether they want to pay hopefully lower ordinary income tax at the time of grant uh, and then receive the future capital gain treatment or they can take a wait and see approach and only pay tax if and when the restricted stock vests uh, and importantly i note that as a practical matter the tax that's paid in connection with making an 83b election is not going to be something that an employee can recoup if for example they terminate employment prior to vesting and they forfeit the stock so it is a real choice that they need to make Thanks. That, that's really helpful. And it's, there's clearly a lot of similarities between the concept of 83B and 431 elections. Um, one of the main areas to note is the difference is that um, in the US, I understand the election needs to be filed with the IRS, whereas in the UK, there's no need to file the election. However, in the UK, you do need your employer to sign up to your election as well. Dave, can I ask? Is the 83B election strictly required in the US in all circumstances? In the UK, although it's standard practice always to make a 431 election, technically it's not required if the employee pays full unrestricted market value, by that I mean the value ignoring any restrictions on the shares, on acquisition. Having said that, we generally always recommend that an election is signed anyway. So as I was noting before, you know, making an 83B election is a choice. It's never strictly required. And again, if you're if you're getting something with actual real value like restricted stock at the time of grant, an employee really needs to decide if they want to pay tax up front or wait. In terms of recommendations, though, when someone's receiving a profits interest, we almost always recommend that somebody make an 83B election because from a tax perspective, the profits interest are treated as having zero value at grant. And so there's no actual tax owed by by a participant um, in connection with making that 83B election. It's also helpful to have done that, and, and for that reason, we often call these protective 83B elections, because if a profit interest is disposed of within two years of grant, meaning it falls out of the safe harbor rules to qualify as a valid profit interest, having made that 83B election can help protect a participant from future adverse tax consequences. One other point just to think about in the context of elections is relocation from the US to the UK. So what should a manager do who's US resident at the time they acquire their shares, but may move to the UK prior to selling those shares in respect of their UK tax position? Well, as we mentioned earlier, there's a time limit to enter into a 431 election in the UK of 14 days following the acquisition of the shares. This is a strict time limit and there's no possibility of making an election after its expiry. So it wouldn't be possible for our hypothetical manager to make an election when they later relocate to the UK. If the manager has any UK earnings at the time of acquiring shares, they should make a section 431 election on acquisition. If, however, they don't have any UK earnings at that time, it's actually not technically possible to make a valid 431 election. So if they subsequently move to the UK and sell the shares, they'd be doing so without the benefit of the election. If they paid unrestricted market value for their shares, though, they should be outside of the employment tax regime and in capital treatment on their sale anyway. Thanks, Viv. Well, I think that brings us to the end of part one of this episode. Thank you very much to Dave Moore Christensen from Chote for all your insights today. We have loved having you on the podcast. We hope this has been a useful summary of some of the key aspects of UK and US taxation and in relation to the structuring of management incentive plans. And we hope that you join us for part two. Dave, where can listeners find you if they have any questions of what they've heard from you today? Yeah, well, 
Silvana, thanks again for having me. You know, listeners can find me by Googling my name and Choate or searching on our website, www.choate.com. They can also reach me via email at dmollochristensen at choate.com. Thanks again, Dave. Um, listeners, thanks for joining us. If you have any questions for Travis Smith about what we've discussed today, you can reach Silvana, me, or the rest of the Global Mobility team through the Travis Smith website. Mm -hmm.